And we're very pleased to be joined by David Chong. He's the Public Safety Commissioner for the City of White Plains, and he's kind enough to give us a few minutes. Commissioner, thank you very much for Phil. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be on the show. Interesting time uh, to be in law enforcement nowadays. Um, and uh, what folks may not know is, um, both before your time in Mount Vernon and also in White Plains, you were a member of the NYPD force um, uh, for the majority of your career, right? More than 20 years. Yes, that's correct. I, I had a very full and fulfilling career uh, with the NYPD, and then I came up here and assumed the, you know, a couple of the positions up yep. here. Um, you heard what uh, Commissioner Bratton had to say. He said you'd have to go back to the 60s or 70s to see the level of anti-police sentiment that he finds today. Um, do, you, do you echo that sentiment that, that what's out there right now we haven't seen in a long time in terms of the reaction, particularly in certain communities towards police? Uh, yes, I do. It's a difficult time for police right now. Uh, we are under the microscope. Uh, I, I think partly to do with that is the availabilities of so quickly being able to send something out through social media. Uh, back when I first became a police officer in 1980, uh, you know, the, we had an ability to respond to things. And it was a good eight hours, at, you know, if, if at all, you know, b if we could respond and we could give our side of the story. Right now, it's very difficult with mass media. People can doctor things, they can send things out, they can send things out through different channels. And a lot of times, people get carried away and they get caught up in the emotions and don't allow us to explain ourselves or our actions. Um, I put it into context, and I don't expect you, nor can you, I guess, talk about these cases, because there's, in some cases, ongoing litigation around it. but. High-profile cases, whether it be the Ridley or the Chamberlain case, would they have to be handled differently now in the immediate after? And I ask that because we saw how in Baltimore the situation was handled. We even saw recently in Wisconsin when the district attorney came out and before he read that there was no indictment, he gave the minute-by-minute -minute, um, explanation of what they believe happened in the run-up to that uh, fatal shooting. Um, and literally um, brought you into that stairwell to explain why he didn't and then did a plea for peace invoking Dr. King. It seems as if there's almost a plea for calm right now uh, when explaining actions. Would you have had to handle things differently? I know you weren't there in both cases at the time, but in high profile cases, if they happened in your particular community now? Uh, I believe that uh, now, in today's day of age, uh, transparency is really, really important, and you really have to get in front of the story before people start to imagine things or think things. And quite honestly, uh, you know, there are a lot of provocateurs out there now. It seems to be more than, than ever uh, anti-police provocateurs out there that are just waiting for an incident to happen and to be able to quite honestly uh, you know try to impress upon a community that something's wrong and uh, so as a police commissioner that's always uh, my concern uh, is, is the transparency of the department and you mentioned Christopher Ridley uh, I happen to be Christopher Ridley's police commissioner in Mount Vernon when, yeah. when uh, Christopher Ridley lost his life and I, I actually was the commissioner on White Plains uh, during the Chamberlain case, but I can't discuss those cases. But uh, I will tell you that in today's day of age, I think it's very important for law enforcement to get out in front, be as transparent as possible, and to explain to people what's going on because of all the, there, you know, and I'll say some professional provocateurs out there that are just looking to jump on issues. You have a reputation um, of, of somebody who goes into the community to talk to not just the stakeholders here, but to get the pulse of the community that you're policing. Do you find now, more than in recent memory, you could have the same situation and you'll get one complete perspective from the precinct house, right? And then you'll go in the community and get a completely different perspective, even over the same chain of events or an incident that may have happened, where one community says, particularly communities of color, and, and you'd certainly have large populations in, in uh, White Plains and before that in Mount Vernon, 
where they say, we're being targeted, we're being singled out by law enforcement. Then you go in the precinct house and they feel like, you know, leadership doesn't have our backs here, uh, we're being sold out, um, where in years prior they would have gotten the benefit of the doubt. Are you finding that it's growing wider, not smaller, the divide? Well, um, again, you, part of my job and part of my responsibility is to keep transparency alive, which, which means, you know, I, I believe that an educated community, you know, I, I still believe, and, and, and I tell this to everybody, and I tell this to the recruit classes and everybody that I can say, 98% of people are good. They're law-abiding people that just want to get by through life. And then, you know, you'll always have those 2% that you can never satisfy. Um, and going with that thinking, as long as the community is educated in what is going on, then I believe the community will come around. It's just the transparency of it and being able to get in front of some of these things. Some of these things we can't even get in front of before we see it posted online somewhere. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to recover. So, you know, in, in White Plains, uh, I've got a mayor and I've got a city council that has just agreed to put body cameras on all of our police well, that's officers. That's what I was gonna ask you next. Before you talk about why, could you have imagined, even if the technology was available 10 years ago, selling that um, to your department and they would have been agreeable to it? I mean, talk about just using a five, 10 year, whatever time period you think would be a good one, to sh talk about how much of a genesis where now you have police that are not only willing, but looking forward to it. So there's a documentation, not just in the squad car with the dash cam video, but a body cam right on the uniform. Well, it, it, it's true. Uh, right now, it's, it's widely accepted. Again, you know, our, our police officers are from the community. And all the, the young men and women that we're hiring now, uh, is from this technical age. So there's much more acceptance to that. When I first became a police officer, uh, it was something that was strange to us. Uh, I remember quite clearly not being very happy about having dashboard cameras, you know, thinking that, uh, you know, everybody is watching what I'm doing and second guessing of, of what I'm doing and everything else. But, you know, in today's society, uh, you know, we have, we're hiring young officers that are very, very familiar with technology. Uh, they communicate, they're, they're doing their own videos on their own cell phones, all this other stuff. And honestly, you know, transparency is what's going to have to happen, you know, more and more, because the public is seeing something. And in my day, it was a picture tells a thousand stories. Now, that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. You can actually take a video and if you're you know, tech, technically savvy, you can put it out on social media and you can doctor it. The one good thing about police body cameras is we can't doctor that video. That video is evidentiary and once it's recorded, it's recorded and it goes into a cloud and only certain people can access it, but we can never doctor it. And so this way, when I present that video, if it's in contradiction to whatever video is being put out on social media, I think uh, the 98% that I say is, is the good part of everybody uh, are gonna come out and they're gonna take a look at it, an intelligent look at it and say, okay, now I understand what happened. And I think the police officers realize that it's, it's for their benefit. You made a couple of interesting points, um, do them one at a time. You made the point of the 98% rule and I, I've heard different variations of that. I remember covering commissioner when there was a church abuse scandal and my church, the Catholic church, uh, were so pervasive and in 98% or whatever the right number is that the priests were good and decent, but as a profession, they were brought down by the actions of the few who did such horrific things and were aided or embedded or covered up for their actions by, by leadership. Is there a risk? The perception of the public, especially some of those same communities is the bad apples are always either protected or the blue wall of silence goes up, making it really hard to bring justice here. And because the bad apples aren't rooted out, the entire profession of law enforcement gets a black eye as a consequence of it. 
people don't believe that police are held to the same standard or have to bear the same rules after a questionable incident. They have a longer window of time before they have to go and deliver a statement to the police here. Uh, the cooperation sometimes from law enforcement, uh, I'm not saying in your communities, but in other communities, hasn't been, uh, let's just say, transparent, as you mentioned. Speak to that. Ha have is that blue wall of silence, how pervasive is it and how hard is it to break through it so the public can have faith that everybody gets the same justice? Well, I, I'll tell you, um, you know, the, the blue wall of silence has been something that's been mentioned, I believe, since policing has first started. Um, you know, policing themselves, you know, uh, officers uh, tend to socialize with each other, tend to be their own kind of community, tend to think that, uh, you know, only they can understand what officers have to be faced with. You, there, there are approximately 900,000 police uh, or sworn law enforcement officers across the United States. The engagement of sworn law enforcement officers on a daily basis is tremendous. Uh, you know, do we get a bad apple once in a while? Do we get someone who shouldn't be a police officer once in a while? Of course. With those kind of numbers, it does happen. But if you think about the engagements, the number of engagements of law enforcement all over this country every 24 hours, and then you think about the one or two or three or four or even five incidents that raises the cackles of people, it really is a relatively small percentage. And I will tell you that I feel we're held to a higher standard. I know that I hold my police officers to a higher standard. And because they're sworn police officers and because they possess so much power, I often tell them that they are the closest representation of government that people actually see. And, you know, part of that is, is that, you know, nowadays police officers are called for everything. We are society's problem solvers. And we're called from anything from a raccoon in a garage to somebody with psychological problems that are terrorizing their family. And, you know, officers have to act appropriately. And it's a minute by minute, sometimes second by second, decision mm -hmm. on what the officers have to do. And you mentioned before, you have um, obviously tried to have officers that are part of their community. It's been said in other areas in this country that the police force is not reflective. Take Ferguson, for example, a population nearly three quarters African American, yet the police force more than 80 some odd percent white. Should there be, um, if not quotas, some kind of uh, formula that the police force is reflective of the community they're policing uh, by ethnicity or color? Uh, and to that end, should you have certain geography requirements where if the people live in the community that they police, uh, they probably have a better idea and are more involved um, with those people rather than somebody will parachute in and out uh, when their shift is on? Mm -hmm. Well, I I'll tell you, you know, there, there's this, this is a debate that has been going on since I got into law enforcement. Um, you know, when I first became a, a, an officer, uh, there were very few Asians on the New York City Police Department. New York yeah. City Police Department, largest police department in the country, and there were very few Asians. Uh, you know, at, from a managerial standpoint, I want the very best candidate. I want the person that is going to be the very best police officer, and I have to kind of be colorblind. But I also understand uh, that we want people that have grown up in the community, that know the community, that are a reflection of the community, a reflection of their culture, reflection of their religion, reflection, you know, went to school with, you know, so it's a fine balance again. Because, you know, what, one of the things that I feel is that we have to get more people because we're under, civil service law where we're under requirements to test people and have people you know we just can't go out there and say oh you know I like you but because of the way you look you know will you become a police officer what we have to do is you know these folks have to you know we have to reach out to the community get the very best have them take the exam have them qualified and absolutely I, I am very big into changing 
uh, a police department and making it very reflective of the community that they serve. Uh, do we want officers to live in our community? We absolutely do. But again, there are certain, you know, there, there are certain standards, you know, officers. I, I, I know that um, when I was a young New York City police officer, you know, I came from New York City. Uh, I lived at home with mom and dad. But for me to actually go out and be able to afford to yep. buy a home in New York City on a police officer's salary was very difficult for me. I would have loved to live in the city. Uh, but I ended up moving out to the suburbs uh, and commuting into the city because uh, it w I was following the American dream of mm -hmm. having a house and owning sure. a house. So uh, I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, Do you it did. It's a, it's a, and there's no easy answer to this. And unfortunately, there's so many of these questions about policing in 2015, wherever we are in the country, there's no simple answers. The one common thing we've seen in so many of these high-profile cases is um, black person, unarmed, um, police, and obviously each case is different here, fatal shooting. If somebody, take your community, says, you know what, Commissioner, I get treated different um, because I'm black than if I was white. And if you look at some of the numbers that came out of the city, and I know you're familiar with them, who is... Um, stopped and frisked. When it's community policing, who gets targeted? We saw in New Jersey the driving while black report that came out. Who gets pulled over a heck of a lot more even though they're driving the same speeds? Is it fair to say, for whatever reason, that there is different treatment if you're black than if you're white right now in this country? Um, and I know it's different in different places. It's an overarching question. But is it a legitimate question if you go to certain communities that are in your jurisdiction and they say, hey, Commissioner, you know what? I'm a black guy. I get treated different than that guy, if you pointed at me. What would the answer be? Well, uh, the, the answer would be, and, and, you know, it's not a simple an answer, okay? The answer would be, you know, maybe you do because there's more officers in a community where the crime rate is higher. And, you know, because the crime rate is higher, we have to have... So, for uh, so, you know, uh, uh, more enforcement in that area to reduce crime. Uh, I, I tend to believe that you know you you put the officers where there's problems, which is crime, and this way the officers can reduce crime. Now, uh, you know, you look at some of the statistics, you look at some of the numbers. That's where it falls on my shoulders. I have to have a police department that is colorblind. And I have to have a police department that treats everybody fairly. But if a large number of my department is assigned to large areas where there are, is upticks in crime and everything, it's just natural the engagements will be more in those areas. Now, that's not saying we're targeting people. What we're doing is we're targeting crime. And I've gone to communities that have absolutely, in my time in the NYPD during the 1980s and the early 90s, that were absolutely under siege. And these folks were crying for help. And they wanted to see police officers out there. And they wanted to see police officers take action out there. And so it's a partnership. And, you know, if there is a double standard, that's got to fall on my shoulders. It's got to fall on the leadership of the department. I have to look at my numbers and I have to question my commanders all the time because I, I will not tolerate a double standard. Mm. But I also not tolerate crime in neighborhoods that are spiking. You know, that, that's part of what our responsibility is to, the, let's say, the 98%. It's just finally a sense, Commissioner, that as much as any recent time here, I, and I, I know if we go back to the 60s and 70s um, and the data will prove it, it was a much more violent time and everything else, but it seems, whether it's new technology or the, the climate that we're in right now, given the high profile, just a little flicker could set off a, a major fire in terms of the tensions in, in so many cities in this country. Um, and even in rural communities as well, let alone suburban. 
is that is that an accurate representation of what's out there right now that it could be a tinderbox given the frustrations especially in the last year that have built up over different you know date lines and different stories well y yes because because of all the news coverage and everything on these different incidents and you know i i have my own opinions about all these different incidents but it's a very difficult time for policing right now and i think you know the solution to that is that you know we have to be a, above above the crowd let's say and above the mm -hmm. rancor and we have to come out with more communications we have to be more um more orientated to transparency and it's it's all law enforcement has always been a partnership uh the police officer is no good without the residents respecting them and working with them but if the residents don't trust the police then that's a problem mm. and so we have to you know do our very best people like myself have to do our very best to try to bridge that gap a and i don't know where that gap came from i i i know that you know when crime was let's say during the crack time and everything else and homicides and everything were, were, were going you know sky high there was a time where aggressive policing was necessary to knock that kind of crime down but i think right now with crime being knocked down so much it's just basically preserving it but also now again scaling back a little bit uh, on the aggressive tactics yep and going back out and reaching out and touching the community and letting the community know that we are them we're one you know we're not separate we're we're one well, certainly a challenge, but I definitely appreciate you giving us some time and some insight today. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. It's always a pleasure.